This is Chris Lutz interviewing Charlie O'Rock in Atlanta, Georgia on July 24th, 1995. This is Charlie O'Rock. Charlie, where and when were you born? I was born in Virginia uh, in 1943. Mm-hmm. Did you grow up in Virginia? Grew up in Virginia. Uh -huh. My father was a dairy farmer and he was exempted from the draft. He had real mixed feelings about it because he uh, was always excited about hearing about the Marines in the South Pacific and always thought he should go, but he had one child already and uh, I'm sure my mom was glad that uh, he didn't have to go to the war. But anyway, he sat it out on the dairy farm. Uh, and your mom was a, a farm wife? Yeah, and that was really the time when labor was real short that she worked a lot on the farm. I remember pictures of her. You didn't have to go to the war, but anyway, he sat it out on the dairy farm. Uh, and your mom was a, a farm wife? Yeah, and that was really the time when labor was real short that she worked a lot on the farm. I remember pictures of her uh, driving a team of horses or something. And, uh, um, but she was also a school teacher. And as soon as we were in school, she was back in school herself. How long did you stay on the farm? Until I got out of high school, a few weeks after my 17th birthday. And where'd you go then? I, uh, I went to Virginia Tech for a couple of years of engineering school. Mm -hmm. And then I went in the Army for three years. Took an overseas discharge and worked in Vietnam for about six months to uh, make a lot of money and to get a little closer to the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I spent the other six months traveling around Southeast Asia and Middle East and this kind of thing, having all my adventures while I was able to do it. What kind of adventures did you have? Tell me an adventure. Oh, God. I worked... Um, I worked three months in India with Tibetan refugees, and uh, I was I was hooked up with this really eccentric English woman who was totally independent. And the uh, the conduit for government funds to the Tibetan refugees was through something called the Lowell Thomas Foundation. I didn't know any of this when I was in India. I had gone there because. Uh, I'd read something about some statement that Dalai Lama had made in the early or mid 60s. I got out of the army in the mid 60s about the Tibetans were being killed off by the Chinese who had occupied Tibet after the Chinese Revolution. I was very anti-communist, anti and uh, so I wanted to go there and assist. I was, you know, real uh, pulled by the, the moral questions and. Uh, this English woman, Jill Buxton, who had sold her farm in England after her husband was killed in World War II, and had sort of financed her way doing refugee work first with the displaced personnel, with the VPs of Europe, and then later on with uh, Tibetan refugees in India. She was certainly a very conservative, pro-Western type person politically, but the the, the really uh, sneaky peats who were involved in Tibetan refugee stuff, totally unofficially. It was never acknowledged that the United States government gave any money to Tibetans, but there was a lot of CIA organizing activity. Uh, and I worked with a, a tribe of Tibetans called Kampas, who had not recognized the Dalai Lama as their spiritual and political leader. Kampas? Compass, K H A M P A S, and um, they were totally destitute. We're getting no aid from the biggest aid giver, the Lowell Thomas Foundation, because they didn't kowtow to the Dalai Lama. And um, I, I had some innocent little encounters with uh, Lowell Thomas. Totally, totally naive. Didn't know anything about anything that was going on. And, uh, but 
when I went to get my three-month visa extended so I could stay there longer, I was, it was denied to me. And I had remembered a threat that this guy at the Lowell Thomas Foundation had made to me. He says, I know you, you work with Jill Buxton, and we're going to get you, get rid of you. And uh, I figured it was due to some intervention, basically, after I found out the whole sordid story about the CIA links and all the, the money channels into Nepal and India to Tibetan refugees. Uh, I figured, you know, they didn't appreciate some American kid who didn't know what was going on, who happened to work with some, certainly not anti-American British woman, but she was just not on their payroll, and so they didn't like her. And, uh, but, gosh, that, uh, uh, that was just kind of the, the stuff I did. Actually, I had a huge political conversion on that whole trip uh, because I didn't have to stay in Vietnam like the GIs did. I could, I worked as a construction contract, uh, worked for a construction contractor there building airfield. Uh, when I started, when I got the urge to leave, I left. And so I was more open to really analyzing my experiences there. Well, what had, had you served? in the war itself when no. you were in the army? No. Oh, okay. I had actually joined the army to do it, but the army never does things that way. They only send people there that didn't want to go there. <laughs> and people that did, they sent to the other side of the world. And uh, so, uh, and I, you know, I had done everything possible. I had volunteered for the Airborne, I volunteered for Special Forces, and they sent me to a uh, Special Forces unit in Germany that was one of John, the 10 Special Forces Group, which was one of John Foster Dulles' fantasies about foaming revolutions in Eastern Europe. And so I was on a, a Czech, uh, an A-team that was, uh, I was on several different A-teams. One, for a very brief time, I was on a Russian team, and then I was on a Czech team, and then I was on a East German team for my longest time. And as a consequence, I learned German. I, I was sent to a language school. And we did a lot of fun maneuvers, playing guerrillas and being chased by regular infantry troops and big NATO maneuvers. And stuff. But I never got to Vietnam, and so I went there on my own mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, after my discharge. And had a political gestalt, huh? Yeah. yeah. How so? Uh, you, you're asking a lot of questions that could lead to some really long war stories. But, uh, <laughs> um, well, sure, as long as you like. <laughs> well, we were we were building airfields uh, around Chu Lai, which was, uh, I don't know, maybe 35, 40 miles south of Da Nang. It was up in what we call I Corps, uh -huh. I for number one, the Roman numeral one. And um, we had, this was in the spring of 66, and the Marines had had an amphibious landing, I think their only amphibious landing of the whole war, uh, at Chu Lai, and because it was an area that was really controlled by the VC. Chu Lai was, was where the 24th Infantry Division was a couple of years later, or three years later, that uh, was involved in the My Lai Massacre. But the population around there was sympathetic to the VC. And you know, we didn't have a area, the GIs, the Marines there, and the civilian construction workers didn't have an area where we could go and and uh, go to whorehouses or bars or anything like that because everything was pretty much off limits. You just had your little your little uh, uh, perimeter there. Although the rock quarry I worked in, I was a blast informant in, in the rock quarry because I went there and I had an MOS. From special forces of, of combat engineers and of course I, I've never seen a rock quarry in my life because the demolitions that I had been trained in was bridge destruction and, and uh, blowing up uh, uh, power plants and all this kind of thing you know uh, but it's real funny I I, uh, I lied my head off getting the job got the job but when I was assigned to the uh, to the quarry foreman. He, he, he's, 
I was hired as a blasting foreman. And the quarry superintendent, who was an old guy whose name was also Charlie, he said, uh, well, what's your experience, kid? And I said, well, I'll tell you the truth, uh, Charlie, it's the first rock quarry I've ever been in in my life. He said, don't do nothing, just watch everything I do. So I watched him for three days. And uh, he was a, he had a pretty heavy drinking habit. And uh, the third night that I was there, about two or three in the morning, Everybody else was asleep, and Charlie was finishing up the last of his of his bottle in his, his uh, in the Quonset hut we slept in. And there was a VC sapper squad infiltrated into the perimeter, into our camp. And I don't know what they were going to do. I don't know if they're going to blow up some of the bulldozers or what. But they had carried satchel charges. That's why they call a sapper squad. And uh, the Marine guard on the water tower was firing at him with his M60 machine gun. So all hell broke loose. And this, this, this guy up on the water tower got shot through the leg, but he kept shooting. And so there was a little firefight going on and everybody woke up and, and I was a little scared of these guys. These were old guys in their 40s. <laughs> and, uh, and I was 22. But they had, when they got over there, they, they did what we called in the army profiling, you know, having great pictures of taking holding uh, Thompson submachine guns or, you know, all this exotic armor, you know, and a lot of guys had bought hand grenades. Jesus. And, uh, you know, I just thought we were head for a disaster if we were ever attacked because hand grenades would kill a lot more of us if they didn't throw them very far. I mean, we didn't have like a, 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 a fortification line or anything you could hide down and throw grenades over. And, uh, anyway, we all ran for the uh, mortar pits which were these uh, sandbagged structures that you get inside and it'll protect you from shrapnel. And uh, Charlie was so drunk, he staggered out of the Quonset hut, out the gate of the camp, out the perimeter gate, and down the road about 200 yards and passed out drunk, and the MPs found him the next morning. And he was fired. And uh, they put me in charge of the quarry which was real fortunate that I'd had the three days with him. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I had a few uh, unfortunate encounters. I put the wrong caps in the wrong position and, and uh, blew up half the quarry, uh, almost tore up some D9 dozers and other kinds of things. You're supposed to time your blasting caps so the explosion starts the the furthest away from the face, and then the last thing to blow is the row of holes that have the dynamite in them at the face, and so everything just kind of falls down, and I put them exactly opposite. And so the first caps of blue were the ones right at the face, and they just went out, shot out like this, and the next ones just followed it. And this rocks just fell everywhere, and I jumped under this D9 dozer. Anyway, um, but one time I was on one Sunday afternoon, we were off on Sundays for a while, uh, and a while we worked seven days, but one Sunday when I was off, I had walked through the Marine base over to the beach and was just checking out the beach, and I was just, I walked along the beach and it was just like tons and tons and tons of equipment that had been unloaded from all these LSTs. And I got up on the sand dune and I could see for miles down the beach there was just these stacks uh, of, of equipment. And it just kind of stunned me the enormous effort that this war was. And I was walking back through the Marine base, going back to the construction camp, and evidently I was walking through the yard of this um, officer's club. Because I heard this voice call out, hey kid, who the hell are you, what are you doing? I turned around and there was this guy standing in the door of this building, motioning to me to come to him. So, I was, and I was, my hair was not long by hippie standards, but it was a lot longer than a GI haircut. And so I was clearly a civilian. This guy didn't know any civilians were over there. He was a Marine major and he was really plastered and he asked me to come in and have a drink with him. And I did. And uh, we were talking, I mean, you know, 
whatever talk you can do with a drunk. And I said, you know, something's really bothering me. We got everything over here, including the kitchen sink. And we outnumber the Viet Cong three to one, according to Robert McNamara's figures. And we've got air power, and we've got tanks, and we've got APCs, and we've got all kind of weaponry. How come we're not kicking their ass? Why are we not really winning this war? And this guy said, um, kid, I'll tell you the whole story. <laughs> he says, you're never going to win this war until you kill every man, woman, and child in North Vietnam and lock up every man, woman, and child in South Vietnam. And I said, but we're here to give freedom and democracy. You don't, you don't kill people or lock them up if you want to give them freedom. He says, that's just what the politicians say. To get people to support it. And I said, well, well what are we here for? And he said, come here, boy. And he pulled me out and he to the to the front door of the office club and he pointed up to the uh, American flag, the, um, the division, third division flag. He says, that's what we're here for. And it didn't make any, you know, I didn't quite grab his logic or anything like that. He was drunk. So, you know, a few minutes later, we we parted company. But that really challenged my, uh, my all my easy answers. It made me really start trying to figure out what, what we really were doing. And uh, a number of other things happened, but a few months later, you know, I decided that I wasn't attributing anything to anything that was important to me anymore, uh, and I'd go home. So I broke my contract and went home. And what did you do when you got home? Uh, I went back to school, mm -hmm. except I got out of engineering and I went into history uh, because I wanted to figure out what it was we were doing in Vietnam, and I couldn't find out there. And it was real interesting because I did find out the next year I took a lot of Asian history courses, Chinese history, learned about the Opium War, uh, and uh, where the British had uh, declared war on China because China was burning up when the British would import opium into China from India, where they grew the opium, and they were getting rich off of this opium trade, the Chinese would burn it up so it wouldn't... Uh, get any more of their people addicted and uh, the British declared war on China because they were interfering with their free trade of opium importation and of course the Chinese uh, whipped their butts and some of the prizes of their victory was they got unrestricted rights to import opium and two they got Hong Kong some of the prizes of the British victory all right the British victory and uh, I remember thinking, damn, we look just like the British, we look just like the French, because I've been reading about the French, sorry, history of colonialism in Vietnam. Maybe we're on the wrong side. Anyway, that, that, that began a process of radicalization. Uh, got me involved in the anti-war movement, and which eventually got me involved in the labor movement. Because one of the things that was interesting to me was I was going to school in Blacksburg, Virginia, which is real near West Virginia, which is very near the coal fields. And um, one of the statistics I read about the war was that per capita, West Virginia sent more kids off to the war than any other state and had a lot to do with the economic opportunities in uh, West Virginia, which were less than any other state, except for the coal industry. You could become a coal miner. And I was thinking, you know, the unions ought to be against this war. Because the expression that the rich man's war and a poor man's fight was certainly true in West Virginia if nowhere else. But by and large, the unions were supporters of the war. And that gave me a bad taste in my mouth about the leadership of the labor movement. And the other thing, that was going on was that there was a huge 
a grassroots rank and file revolt against the gangster that ran the United Mine Workers, Tony Boyle. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tony Boyle sent some gun thugs and had John Kublonski, his wife, and his daughter murdered in their beds in the winter of 69. And uh, I was, you know, I was never really thrilled with the student anti-war movement because I felt, hey man, I, you know, I come from rural Virginia, off of a farm, and if the issues of the war don't make sense to folks like where I come from, then, you know, I don't want to be part of a movement that just enjoys freaking out straight people. And uh, so I figured that I'd like to see what was going on with this uh, rank and file movement against Tony Boyle and the leadership of the UMW. And uh, to see if there could be any connection between this grassroots revolt and changing the uh, uh, union's policy towards the war because the war was not doing West Virginian working people any good at all. It was making a lot of construction contractors like the ones I'd worked for very, very rich, and a lot of defense industries. So uh, I, uh, I started making some contacts with people. I know some miners had come to Blacksburg and to Clinch uh, Valley College in southwestern Virginia in the coal fields, trying to look for some aid in producing some literature for the uh, the reform movement within the United Mine Workers. And I got caught up with some people who were active in both the Black Lung Association, the Miners for Democracy, and something called Disabled Miners and Widows, who Tony Boyle, who had been stealing money out of the uh, Health and Welfare Fund, had cut off disabled minors and widows of minors to cut their health benefits off, which was just incredibly outrageous to me. And I was just real interested in this movement, and I helped it out everywhere I could. Got to be friends with Arnold Miller, who later became the president of the mine workers. What was he like? Arnold was a real country boy. He was just a really laid back, very honest guy. He was not a real shrewd politician. You know, I mean, he, he didn't last long as a president. Uh, but I really think he was a pretty honest guy. Uh, he had a real strong moral sense of right and wrong. And uh, he, uh, the real Sharpies were in the northern West Virginia, southwestern Pennsylvania movement called Miners for Democracy. Uh, but they they uh, they stood aside and let Arnold Miller be the their pre uh, presidential candidate, and uh, and he was able to beat Tony Boyle. And it's a funny thing that there was a real relationship between Tony Boyle and Hubert Humphrey and the Democratic Party. And as a result. Although a lot of evidence pointed to Tony Boyle's involvement in the murder of John Jablonski and his family, the FBI didn't start an investigation until the Miners for Democracy uh, pulled everybody on wildcat strikes. There were a tremendous number of wildcat strikes that went on in the coal fields. And that was one of the ways that disabled miners and widows uh, fought. And I was looking for a way to support myself and to be involved in the union <clears throat> and was not successful in getting a job in the coal mines. And I think maybe it had leaked out and I was being, uh, uh, what, what my intentions were in terms of uh, the movement, the reform movement. Anyway, I was not getting hired. So I went to work for a construction contractor that was building storage silos uh, for coal companies. And these guys were in a uh, construction division of the United Mine Workers. Anyway, I needed a job, so I went to work for them. And uh, 
there are two classes of people that worked on this job. One was a permanent core of people that went around from job site to job site, and the other half of the workforce was just hired locally. And I was hired locally, and then I was taken, after the first job was over, I was taken into a permanent core that traveled around. The first job was in, uh, oh, probably uh, Buchanan County. Near, uh, it was near uh, Jewel Ridge in Richland, Virginia, either in Buchanan County or Wise County, but that job lasted a couple of months, and then we moved down to uh, Jasper, Tennessee, outside of Chattanooga, and I was taken on to the permanent core. Uh, they seemed to like the way I worked, and this really outrageous thing happened the day before we left our last day on the job in Virginia. Uh, the shop steward, his name was John, I can't remember his last name, called us into a meeting with the project manager. And the strike was about to happen, the big nationwide coal strike in the fall of 71. I think it broke out in September, and this was late August. And uh, he said, um, we've got, we've worked out a special deal with a company where we can continue working during the strike. And uh, I didn't say anything. I listened to him and uh, he said, we're gonna be outside of the normal range of influence of the Mine Workers Union, you know, down here in South Tennessee. So we won't have to stop working during the strike. So after the meeting broke up and this project manager went away, I told John to hang around, and I just jumped all over it. I said, don't you ever have a meeting to discuss as crucial an issue of whether or not we're going to scab during our own union strike or not with a project manager around. This is something we've got to decide together. He says, no, no, this has been decided at the top by the union. This has been cleared by the president of the union. I said, I don't give a damn who's cleared it. This, you know, the decision of whether to scab or not should be ours. And I don't like it worth a damn. Well, unfortunately, I was a minority one. Everybody else was delighted by it. <laughs> uh, I was very uh, discouraged and uh, kind of disheartened. And I went to see Arnold Miller. I said, what do I do? He says, well, you're not going to be doing much if you quit. He says, just stay with the job. And at some point, we'll probably send some pickets, some roving pickets down there to Jasper and shut you all down. Well. Things got more interested when we got down to Jasper. Some Japanese had bought the mines there and we were reopening, some old mines, and we were reopening and we were building these storage silos. It was uh, the slip form construction uh, where you pour concrete in these forms that are inched upwards, uh, six to 12 inches an hour by these hydraulic jacks. And you just keep pouring concrete in there and, and you keep going up you get up a couple, about 10 stories, about 100 feet. And it's, it's you know, anywhere from 40 to 80 feet wide uh, in diameter. And... Uh, Is it like a huge pillar? It's like a huge cylinder. Okay. Like a huge beer can. Mm -hmm. uh, 100 feet up, made of concrete, about four inches thick. And um, so... We got down there, and the shop steward and project manager had other news to tell us. One was that since we were out, another benefit to them of being outside of the UMW's range of influence was that the wages could be much lower. And the permanent party was going to continue getting their union wage, but we were all going to keep it a secret from the from the local guys how much we were getting paid and they were going to get paid about a dollar and a half to two dollars less than we were huh. for doing the same work and again I just raised hell and didn't have any support uh, so uh, one of the local guys I took into my confidence and I said look here's the deal we're probably going to get shut down by Arnold Miller and his crew at some point into this job and also, you guys are getting screwed on how much you're getting paid. 
but let's keep this a secret and then let's just decide together when are we going to make this thing public and when are we going to make our move and everything like this because we're dealing with a really bad situation you know we've got a union that's totally sold out and everything else well i couldn't keep it a secret about a month after it started there was a there was i mean people don't keep their paychecks very secret anyway yeah. a lot of the permanent party guys were comparing notes over how much was withheld for this that and the other and so it got out how much they were making and so it just blew up one day and the, the project manager wasn't there he had gotten drunk the night before and broken his leg in a car wreck and so he was in a, a hip to ankle cast and uh, John the shop steward was just freaking out and the guy that was running the crane up and down uh, the 10 stories was freaking out. We were in the final stages of the job, putting a cap on the, on the top. And so, and he threatened me personally. He said, you know, you're trying to take food out of my kid's mouth. And uh, he says, I'll kill somebody for that. So I made sure I rode up and down that concrete bucket, going up and down the job with his best buddy. <laughs> and uh, and uh, at the end of the day, Old Bob, the project manager, shows up, and he comes crutching his way out to the to the concrete bucket, and a couple guys lift him on it, and he gets ridden up to the top to the tenth floor. We help him out, and he makes this announcement: "There's going to be a layoff. All the permanent, all the all the local guys get laid off, and some of the guys whose jobs have been shut down up in the coal fields." <laughs> by the mine workers were coming down to work the job. I thought, damn, I'm in a terrible situation. Uh, here I am, a minority yeah. one in the permanent crew, and all my supporters, who are the local guys, are getting laid off. Uh, and I've been already threatened with death, and everybody is growling at me in the permanent crew. And I was making all these speeches to him. I said, look here, we don't have outhouses. You got to go shit in the woods. You don't have, uh, uh, the boss don't keep ice water out here near enough. We run through it in two hours, and he only replaces it every five or six hours. Uh, the reason we don't have any port johns or any decent supply of water is because he doesn't have to. We, you know, we're not organized as a union. We're a scab outfit. Uh, so this you know, you, you permanent guys think you're getting over, but you're not. I didn't. I didn't cut any ice with anybody. Uh, the main thing they were happy about was that they were working while everybody else was out in the street. So uh, that afternoon, when I left the job, I drove all the way to Atlanta, and uh, I was starting to date Nan at that time anyway. And uh, I just decided not to go back to that job. That uh, wasn't doing any good on that job, and uh, I was putting myself at some risk. So my first day in Atlanta, I uh, went looking for a job. Got hired. The first place I looked was at, which was Atlantic Steel. That was in the very end of October, 1971. And uh, 20, almost 24 years ago. And uh, I brought a very bad attitude with me into the job. I mean, my whole relationship to the labor movement at that point had been that it's corrupt, and the only way people get decent representation is that you build a movement similar to the one in the mine workers. Um, and I knew there were some problems with my local. Uh, your steelworkers local or your old local? Steelworkers local. Okay. Uh, for one thing, uh, all the union activists that I knew were white, and they all told racist jokes. And blacks and whites didn't sit on the same side of the room. Blacks sat on the left side of the room, and whites sat on the right hand side of the room. I didn't go to many union meetings. Uh, the ones I did, I, I sat with the black guys. And 
there was a lot of discontent among a lot of black guys with the leadership because it was all white. And there was one guy, Man Howe, who was a black guy who was on the bargaining committee and, and people thought he was a token black. And I think to some degree he was, but at that time I was a kid, I was rash, I was judgmental, I was smart ass, and I have no idea what Man Howe's leadership was. If it was good, it was bad. I just looked at him with a real jaundiced eye. Uh, and a lot of the young blacks did too. Uh, so I was involved in any kind of effort that was against the existing leadership. Uh, whether it was whether it was um, well thought out or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and part, there, there was a caucus that was started there. And uh, myself and other radicals were there. And it, there were, you know, some of us were real radical. Some of us called ourselves communists. We were all called communists by the leadership of the local. Uh, and basically, my history there, the first 10 years, uh, was one of opposition, marginalization. Uh, there was a lot of things I could have done of good, positive value that had I not been so labeled and so isolated. Uh, and for my part, so uh, narrow-minded, you know, I didn't see the, you know, I didn't see that the situation with the steel workers was really very different than the mine workers. Uh, there was basically no corruption at the top of the steel workers in any degree like there was, say, in the Teamsters or the mine, the mine workers. Uh, they may have been way too conservative for my taste, but they weren't stealing money. And so they weren't you, killing so, their opponents. Well, yeah, that's a plus too. Do you? Um, and they were pretty democratic union based. Do you regret your first ten years then? What would uh, you do differently? I don't think I'd have done anything different because I'd have still been the same age. I'd still had the same experiences I had. I mean, no, I can't regret it. It's just the way things happened. Mm -hmm. uh, Is there anything you did that you were proud of? Sure. Well, tell me about it. <laughs> I went to a union meeting, and uh, I did two things there, and passed them both. Normally, everybody voted against me, <laughs> anything I brought up, and I got both of them passed, uh, which, which the leadership was just outraged. Uh, I remember Ira Richards, that I'm pretty friendly with now. He's retired long since. Ira Richards? Ira Richards. Uh -huh. He went to work for... He was the president for a while and went to work for the International as yeah. an organizer, but before he became president, he was vice president, and Harry Berger was the president. Harry Berger was always a real decent guy. Uh, I, I didn't appreciate that enough because I was such a, a jackass in a lot of ways, but uh, he was a real decent guy, and um, he, <laughs> there was a, uh, Somebody was there, I don't know if it was M.C. Weston, or I think it was, a, it was the uh, assistant district director. I don't think it was the district director who, who was retiring. And uh, he had come to visit, he, because he was in our local. He had come to visit. And so the local leadership was not real happy that I was there uh, raising all my little agendas. But one of the things, I, I think that was in 74, but there was a big wildcat strike movement among coal miners up in West Virginia, which, and I was staying in touch with a lot of the stuff going on up there, against increase in fuel prices, because coal miners had to, uh, it was during the, uh, it was in 74 when all the gas prices went out of sight. And uh, coal miners had to commute a long way to work. I mean, you know, 100 miles wasn't, wasn't a real, unheard of distance to travel for coal miners and they were on strike against gas prices 
and I thought we should support them, send them $100 or $200. They were always sending money to the Red Cross or or some charity or something like this, and I thought we should send some money in solidarity to them. And uh, uh, they, uh, and it passed. I was just amazed. Uh, and the other thing was the guy who was our guest there that night, who, who had come, who was retiring, had asked that we send him to the uh, International Convention on our credentials, just as kind of a sentimental farewell kind of thing. And I spoke out against that. And uh, no, 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 I didn't speak out against that. I spoke out against, he was asking us to endorse George Busby and send some money to George uh -huh. Busby. That's what it was. A couple of hundred dollars and something like this. And um, I spoke out against it. Uh, Lester Maddox, George Busby was running in the primary against Lester Maddox. And I think there were a lot of Maddox supporters at the union meeting that night. I, for some reason, anyway, I just said, look, George Busby has never voted against the right to work law since he's been in the legislature. I don't think we should ever give any money to any politician that doesn't fight tooth and nail against the right to work law. And the whole room broke into applause. And I think some of these guys were Lester Maddox supporters who didn't want to do <laughs> Well, hey, uh, you make a pact with the devil sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, but I was blown over. I was blown over. And this was a huge embarrassment to the leadership because here this guy had come and given a sentimental appeal. And I said, let's give it to the coal miners instead. And the room just broke out into applause. And, uh, and all our riches jumped up and wanted to fight and everything. You know, it was, uh, I, 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 just, I was just amazed. I was stupefied. I, I had no idea that anything I'd ever proposed that Union Local would ever be accepted. Mm -hmm. But uh, then later on, um, how I started getting active in the local was in 81, 10 years after I'd been there. Red Knox was, was the president of the local. And the international, we were having Solidarity Day. The first Solidarity Day in Washington, D.C. was happening in 81 because uh, the labor movement was a little freaked out about what Reagan had done to the air traffic controllers, firing them and everything. And uh, so we were having this big march in Washington. So uh, Red Knox came to me. He said, Charlie, I want you to try to get a bus or two filled up from this local to uh, to go to Washington because the International really wants uh, some participation. I said, uh, well, why do you want me to do that, Red? Uh, he says, well, I can't come out and support Solidarity Day publicly. I said, well, if the International is for it, why can't you come out? He says, well, a lot of guys, especially the ones up in Cartersville, are really uh, down on this thing because it's uh, been endorsed by the NAACP. I said, well, that's real interesting, Red. I said, uh, I'll do it if you promise me that you won't badmouth me behind my back when everybody else is badmouthing me for doing this. He says, no, I'll stay neutral. I said, well, that's, that's real big of you. Well, and, and, uh, I'll, I'll accept the, the, the request. I'll do it. Well, we filled up two buses. And uh, I'm telling some history now that a lot of people don't want to hear because it involves some folks who have since passed. But this is what happened. Uh, I filled up two buses. About a third of the guys were young white guys that I was friendly with. Somebody went around and talked every one of those white guys into getting out of the trip. And they were leadership people. It wasn't Red Knox. Uh, and, um, and Charlie Parker, who's since deceased, was our international rep. Yeah, I heard about Charlie Parker. And Charlie scheduled uh, training, shop steward training, for the sub-district of Georgia. 
to happen that day. And uh, there was a big, there was a big movement against this thing. And Charlie was the international representative. Did you say anything to him? Yeah, I asked him. I said, what'd you do this for? He said, ah, I just got my calendar screwed up. And, and that probably was all he did it, because he was an international rep, and it would have been a feather in his cap to have gotten as mo many people as possible. And he was actually kind of glad that I did it, I think. But somebody was going around, and there, you know, I was the only white guy from my local that went. And uh, Ira Richards came. Now, he had been hired as an organizer by the uh, International. And he came there to kind of lecture us on uh, there's not, not going to be any drinking on this bus and all this kind of thing. And we thought he and, and this woman he brought, who turned out to be his wife, were going on the trip. And we were all going down the rows of chairs introducing ourselves, and she didn't say anything. And somebody said, well, we didn't hear what, how she, we, she didn't introduce us. And our stuff, she, he said, she's not going with you, with you people. down the rows of chairs introducing ourselves and she didn't say anything and somebody said well we didn't hear what how she we, she didn't introduce us and our stuff she, he said she's not going with you with you people that's my wife and people there was just a real atmosphere of just people were really putting us down for going on this trip and it was real funny we got on that bus and we pulled out of Atlanta and we started driving north all night. And we got to Charlotte and we stopped at a, a bus stop or truck stop or something like that. And there were a lot of other buses there. And a lot of buses had mostly black folks from churches, NAACP chapters throughout the South and stuff like this. They all converged. But then in Charlotte, we saw that the clothing and textile workers, or I think it was just the textile workers union at that time, was organized a lot of white folks to go. And these black guys on the buses are saying, who, huh, this isn't gonna be just a black march? This isn't gonna be just a black demonstration? Because they had gotten a sense from the negativity towards them and towards this march that it was a black thing. Uh -huh. And then when we got to DC and we saw that it was maybe 25, 30, 35% black, and it was overwhelmingly majority white, these guys got really upset. They said, where in the hell are the white guys from our local? Don't they believe in Solidarity Day or what? What the hell is going on? And, uh, you know, that's, that's just something, you know, I've always felt that one of the real weaknesses of the labor movement was that they didn't really appreciate that the struggle for basic African-American rights, like the civil rights movement, affirmative action, all that kind of stuff, was and could be the most important ally that the labor movement has. And some of them are coming around to seeing that. They notice that people like John Lewis and other black congressmen have a 100% labor record and they start making connections after a while, but it's uh, it's very difficult. And I can't decide if it's the white leadership uh, being afraid of the white membership and not wanting to challenge them and stretch them and lead them, or if it's they're they're so bad themselves. Uh, that they can't stretch themselves, they can't challenge themselves. Mm -hmm. What but, did you say to the um, white guys who had backed out when you got back? Did oh, I really start? wanted to find out who had talked them out of it. Uh -huh. And it was, it was the people 
and the barring committee. It was the Frank Yorks and all the people that had NAACP baited the whole Solidarity Day. It was the leadership of the local. Hmm. Do you feel like it changed the minds of um, black workers towards uniting with whites any? In the reverse? Well, see, the local had always had a really bad record on equality issues. Uh, the local leadership and the white workers had really opposed a court order to desegregate the cafeteria. And the company solved the whole controversy by closing it. We, uh, there was no cafeteria when I got there in 71. It was closed in 60, 68. And so there's always been a real degree of cynicism. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, a lot of blacks that I, I have heard a lot of blacks say the union represents the best opportunity for black folks that exist to get to, to be able to have a job that pays well. I mean, we're relatively very high paid compared to any non-union job they could find. Uh, and they appreciate that fact, but they, they have no illusions about the attitudes and the, uh, the stands that are taken by a lot of white members and at one point by the leadership. Now, the things have come to a real, you know, and of course, there was a lot of racial polarization in the early 70s. Uh, you know, a lot of people were still stung by the civil rights movement. A lot of people were still big supporters of Lester Maddox. Well, that was his old stumping ground, wasn't it? Yeah, he, he'd worked at Atlantic Steel. As a worker or manager? I think he was a, a turn foreman. Okay. Real low level supervisor. Uh, but, um, you know, I, that, that, it, I don't think it made a huge difference. I think a lot of people were kind of outraged when they got up there and they realized that the union should have done something to get whites there. That this was something that whites should have seen too. And this, and in Atlanta, Georgia, it, in Cartersville, Georgia, it shouldn't have been something that was described as a, a NAACP communist thing. That, uh, that the union should really try to get whites to go there and see what the labor movement from all over the country looked like. You've been a radical at Atlantic Steel now for over 10 years now. I mean, what, almost 20 years, right? Or more? Well, I'm in my 24th year. 24th year. Boy. At varying degrees, varying degrees of intensity of radicalism. Do you find that people's attitudes towards you have mellowed or uh, hardened? Oh, there's hardly, I mean, maybe seven or eight years ago, there were still a couple guys that would Across the street when he saw me come in and would spit on the sidewalk, you know, just because they couldn't stand the taste of me, of my presence in their mouth. But uh, there's practically nobody that won't talk to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's lots of people that would never talk to me. I would say hi and they wouldn't say anything. Uh, Not anymore though, huh? No, I mean, you know, I can win elections at the plant now. I'm in the bargaining committee, I'm the plant-wide grievance chair. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I'm seen as being in leadership. And I think it's a sense that, well, if I don't start that kind of stuff again, they'll forgive me or something, you know, as long as I'm doing something okay. But I'm still not very effective in mobilizing the people in solidarity stuff, like I'm working on this Firestone campaign right now. I can't get very many people out uh -huh. on that. I mean, a lot of the other, locals that represent much lower paid guys like the, at Chattahoochee Brickyard or something like this, they can mobilize 20 people or 10 people or something like this. I'd be lucky to get four. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, that just that just goes into a, the whole issue of in the steel workers union where a huge, huge number of steel mills have closed and many, many other mills have downsized dramatically, including ours. You know, we haven't had any serious hiring in 10 years. 
we've hired every once in a while a maintenance person, a skilled tradesman. Uh, but we haven't hired any production people in years. Uh, and we've been fortunate enough to still be running. But I don't think a lot of the membership know yet that there's not going to be. I mean, some of them are realizing with their own kids that their kids don't have the opportunities that they did. Uh, that, and that we might not have it much longer. I mean, there's so many high-paid jobs that uh, are being eliminated through business decisions, or you can look at Eastern Airlines. The machinist would not take Lorenzo's offer, and they decided to fight. I'm glad they fought. Things would be much worse if businesses thought that they could get their agenda achieved without any struggle. They move slower than they did if the machinists hadn't struck. They, they are hurting, but they did us a big favor. And we should have been duty bound to do everything we could have to support that Eastern strike and every other strike. Firestone, the same thing, you know, when they went on strike, they were all fired, they were all permanently replaced. Same thing happened in Bayou Steel in Louisiana. Uh, in location after location, uh, or it doesn't have to happen with strikes, you know, it's just they decide to close this plant down. The auto workers are seeing that happen all over the place. Yeah. In Alabama, they're putting, a, there's going to be a joint venture between LTV, an American steelmaker, and a Japanese bank Sumimoto to put in a brand new mini mill in Decatur, Alabama that is expected to produce 2.2 million tons of steel a year. Uh, there's a plant, there's a mill somewhat similar that produces half that amount now, 1.1 million tons a year in Gadsden, Gulf State Steel and it has 1,800 employees. So with 330 people, they're gonna produce twice the tonnage of what 1,800 people do, and that's our future. And I think the labor movement's really got to decide how to deal with that. Um, I've heard some people in labor and not say that one of the reasons for uh, episodes like the Vietnam War was that labor and management were cooperating to establish markets for U.S. goods abroad. And um, one of the reasons that we're uh, losing markets and hence losing our, our industrial base is because people opposed uh, incursions like the Vietnam War. How do you respond to something like that? Well, that's, that just, Actually, I haven't heard that too much. Uh, I mean, the Vietnam War uh, was basically a, a huge blip on a graph of enormous defense spending. Uh, and, it, and it cost this country's economy. I mean, one of the reasons that the Japanese, the West Germans, so much were able to make huge gains on the U.S. industrially and economically is they didn't have anywhere near uh, the expenditures for defense that this country's had. Uh, and the reason that we don't, that we're losing our market share in the world is not because we didn't win the Vietnam War. It's because we are having huge competition uh, and we've had it for the last 15 years in ways that we never had after World War II. We were unchallenged after World War II and were for you know a good number of years into the 70s. Well let me throw something else at you. Um, how do you feel, how do you respond to, to company and labor people who say that um, Union people have gotten soft. They're not giving a good day's work for a good day's pay and are getting twice the good day's pay anyway. And that's what's uh, causing uh, our economic crisis right now, shutting the plants down. 
Well, you know, that's a lot of right-wing propaganda. I mean, I think even, even the corporate magazines, Business Week, are saying, actually, we're very, doing very well economically now uh, in certain regards in terms of productivity. Uh, we have had the last 15 years of enormous downsizing, deindustrialization, globalization, exporting jobs overseas. American companies are enormously profitable. They're enormously productive. Um, you know, you can look at Atlantic Steel. There were about 1,400 people when I went there. We've got 600 now. And our tonnage is three times what it used to be. I mean, profitability has steadily increased everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, productivity has increased everywhere. Um, Do you attribute the productivity increase then to technological change? Sure. Yeah. Technological change. And, and in terms of the amount of work that's gotten out of people, I mean, I think people work a lot harder in a lot of ways. People work a lot longer hours. I, you know, one of my favorite sayings these days is half of us are working ourselves to death. I, you know, my department used to have 12 people in it, now it has four. Uh, I get assigned overtime all the time until we get it, until the company has a, a, a cash flow crunch and then they cut out overtime until things just start breaking down so bad they got to start rescheduling over time and then they work us to death again. But half the people in this country are just working themselves to death with two and three jobs or enormous forced overtime. The other half can't get a job. Uh, that amounts to anything more than flipping hamburgers or cleaning janitorial type jobs. And, you know, jobs with no future, no benefits, no flipping hamburgers or cleaning janitorial type jobs and you know jobs with no future no benefits no pension no anything um, and labor has become a lot more productive not just because of technology but because of stress because people have had to work harder just to keep a job uh, and the union the labor movement has kept the worst extremes of that from happening in organized plants and organized places of employment. And that's to their credit. I don't think this working ourselves to death is doing anybody a damn bit of good. And I and it's interesting to me that there's some a few other uh, pro business journals are now starting to question the fact that productivity is way up, profitability is way up but wages are stagnant. That was the cover of Business Week a month ago. And they're concerned that it's going to uh, hurt the buying power and thus the uh, con consumer ability of this country. We won't be much of a market anymore, which is pretty far-sighted viewpoint. I mean, most uh, Fortune and Forbes and all those magazines are just totally thrilled about the pauperization of the American working class and the fact that the stock market just seems to have no limit these days and you can just make a whole lot of money uh, because labor is really getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and technology is just making all kinds of opportunities abound. Well, let's take a break and de-stress ourselves and go get some Tell me what you're doing in the Firestone Open Asset Drive. Well, uh, back in late May, I was called by um, my district director and asked if I would uh, like to come out of the plant for a month or so and work to build support for a boycott of Firestone. And uh, I went up to Pittsburgh for a couple of days of orientation. and. Uh, there was a, a move uh, between the rubber workers and the steel workers to merge. The steel workers had 
taken on the commitment to really support the Firestone workers who had been permanently uh, replaced, fired, uh, after a few months on strike. And that was 4,000 workers around the country in five plants, Firestone plants. Uh, so that, I came to find out, uh, came about because in the mid-80s, Bridgestone had bought out Firestone. Bridgestone, uh, which is Japanese-owned, is the biggest tire manufacturer in the world. And after their acquisition of Firestone, uh, things for a few years continued pretty much as before. Uh, in fact, they won in 1991 an award from the Federal Mediation and <coughs> Conciliation Service, gave them an award because of outstanding labor relations, uh, cooperation between management and labor. And then, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, a guy named Yochiro Kazaki took over Bridgestone. And my own personal belief is uh, that with 19, with plants in 19 countries, Kaizaki made a real obvious choice to try to bust the union in this country because of all the industrialized countries. The United States really has the weakest labor laws, and it has a labor movement that's really in decline and has been taking a lot of ass kicks. Uh, and he put a real unacceptable contract on, uh, offer on the table. Uh, huge cuts in wages and benefits, cuts in uh, uh, health and safety standards, uh, forcing people to go on 12-hour schedules. And the most insulting demand of all was to take all the holidays and put them into uh, floating days to be awarded by the company at their convenience. <laughs> So if business is down or something in October, you can take your 4th of July holiday, even if your kids are in school or whatever. <laughs> Merry Christmas in yeah, September, right? right. <laughs> so uh, uh, the workers decided to strike. The International has said that they were very, very concerned about their ability to win a strike. And uh, their fears were justified. Uh, Kazaki brought in Japanese and Brazilian skilled tire makers, and they scabbed them to death, uh, and then he fired them, and uh, the union has made a, in May they made an unconditional offer to return to work, and a few hundred of them have gotten their old jobs back. Uh, most of them uh, remain fired. Um, and the steel workers made the pronouncement that this was the biggest permanent replacement of striking workers since Reagan fired the air traffic controllers and busted PATCO and that the labor movement really had to do something about this and they took the lead to build support for a boycott of, of uh, Firestone products, tires, and that, and they hired a hundred people, uh, or they had the lost time in my case, pulled them out of the plant. And uh, I've been working for a few weeks building uh, support for the boycott by hand billing and, and uh, Firestone outlets, uh, Sears stores are a big seller of Firestone tires. And one of the things that we've done in this campaign is that we've made a move on the Japanese consulates and embassies to get the Japanese Foreign Service to deliver a letter to the Prime Minister to uh, to asking him to intervene. And this is a real tricky area, real tricky, because uh, in Pittsburgh I really noticed that the temptation to do Japan bashing, to do flag waving, was just more than they could uh, resist. Uh, and that that, and I, I didn't want to have anything to do with a uh, a campaign that that promoted jingoism or did any Japan bashing. And I wrote, I raised in the uh, orientation session, I said, you know, in Atlanta, we've, we've had experience with this. 
that uh, we have a printing plant that was bought by a Japanese bank, uh, uh, Foot and Davies, and they changed the name to American Signature, and they set out to bust the union. And those people have been on strike for over two years now. Uh, and it's very difficult to keep this from becoming a anti-Japanese campaign. Uh, I've seen picket signs that have mushroom clouds on them. There has been proposals to burn the Japanese flag in a ceremony, sort of similar to the Toyota bashing parties that the UAW used to promote. And I said I'm absolutely opposed to it. Uh, and in fact, they had talked about sending a delegation to Japan to appeal to the Japanese trade unions for support. I said, all Bridgestone has to do is show the Japanese trade unions a New York Times picture of a, a picket sign with a mushroom cloud on it, or burning a Japanese flag, and you ain't getting any support. I said, what's happening here is globalization and a global attack on labor, and the only thing we can do is to globalize the labor movement and practice real strong cross-board cross solidarity, and you ain't going to do that with this kind of campaign that really promotes an anti-Japanese flavor. I said, in fact, the target of our campaign should be the corporate agenda and the right-wing agenda, the contract on America that has made it possible for Kazaki to do union busting in this country. Kazaki is nothing more than a Japanese Frank Lorenzo. And we should be opposed to all Frank Lorenzos, wherever they are, and whatever working people they're attacking. Um, and I got some support. And I think it really... My, and, and, and another guy raised a real interesting point in uh, uh, Japan. You know, he didn't come from a theoretical standpoint like I did or, or you know, any kind of radical notion of uh, international labor solidarity or anything like that. He just said, he said, I'm from Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And we had an experience of uh, Indonesians coming to look at buying a plant or something like that. And one of the labor people raised a question with them, uh, well, are y'all going to uh, maintain the seniority system? Because seniority is a real sacred cow here in, in this country. And he said, I don't know if anybody took offense at that remark, but the, the news media went and said it almost caused an international incident because they had said something about sacred cow. He says, and you've got to be real careful. He says, in this campaign, we can't use the word Jack, for example, because they'll get, really get on you if you do that. And I said, hey, freak some more. <laughs> And uh, so I think we kind of turned the tide against that kind of thing, but it didn't go near as far as I wanted to. I said, another experience in Atlanta is that we, you know, we invaded Newt Gingrich's office, we had to sit in there, and we've been having a real big fight by a, a broad section of unions against the contract on America. I said it'd be very easy to integrate this into the overall fight on the contract on America. I said, because this is the living embodiment of the contract on America, you know, is to, is to bust unions, uh, fire striking workers, this kind of thing. You keep calling it contract on America. Yeah, well, hey. Well, you just being... Well, you know, <laughs> no. I mean, everybody I know never says contract with America. <laughs> that, that's, that's Gingrich's statement. Our view is it's the contract on America. It's cute. And uh, yeah, I thought that was a given, but anyway. Uh, so, and they said, uh, "Oh no, we don't want to. We don't want to dilute the campaign." Yeah. And it's just like they don't want to give up the any. They don't want to give up making this Japanese guy the main target, Bridgestone the main target, and make our own politicians, our own corporate agenda that's really making the conditions for union busting possible in this country. Why don't they want to do that? Because they're trying to win pub broad public support for a boycott of Firestone. And they know that unions are pretty much bashed in the popular culture in this country. And, and, and there's, unions are not a real popular cause. They're blamed for a lot of the economic ills, like you mentioned earlier in the interview and that they thought they could get a whole lot more support if they could say, you know, here's this Japanese company trying to take away American ho patriotic holidays like the Fourth of July and Labor Day, and they thought it'd be more successful. And uh, maybe they're right, but as far as I'm concerned, in terms of the long-term interests of the labor movement, it's deadly. Uh, 
Besides, the main problem in this country is not that it's a Japanese company doing this to us, but it is the state of the labor laws in this country, and it's the state of the labor movement, and it's the general powerlessness among working people that makes this possible. You know, Frank Lorenzo did the same damn thing, and he was an American as apple pie. Uh, we have got to be against the Frank Lorenzos of the world. And we won't do it by uh, an emphasis on flag waving and bashing foreigners when we've got to be doing it in concert with, with uh, foreign trade unions. Tell me about uh, this uh, activity at Newt Gingrich's office. When did this happen and what was it about? Uh, this happened in mid middle of March. 1995? Uh, yeah, this year. And uh, it was a great demonstration. You know, we've, we've had so much more labor activism in this city since Stuart Aiko took over. Um, that was practically a revolution uh, because it was the first contested election that I, in, in my history in Atlanta, that ever happened in the Atlanta Labor Council. And uh, the old guard lost. There's just no other way to put it. Uh, and something on the same scale is happening in the National AFL-CIO, but that's another story. It's not to your question, to your thing. But getting back to Gingrich, uh, you know, Stewart has done a lot of mobilizing and is very good at it. You know, he organized the 17,000 uh, strong march in downtown Atlanta around the Olympics, uh, work being done in Union issue. And um, so we organized for some months on this uh, to, and we kept the goal of it very, very quiet. Uh, it was largely a secret. And he only contacted, well, he made a deal with one TV station, I think it was Channel 11, that had exclusive rights to the story. Uh, but they had to be in with us from the very beginning. They, they, and they came to the, to the rally in, at the uh, Electrical Workers Union Hall. They rode up, they caravaned in the buses out to the office. And we had told the police that we were going to park in this church parking lot, which was about half a block away. Uh, what he didn't tell anybody, except the, the marshals and the core leadership people was that the buses were going to be stopped right in front of Gingrich's office. <laughs> we were going to disembark, stop northbound and southbound traffic on that four-lane parkway, race across there, and occupy the building before they had the presence of mind of, to lock the doors. And that's what we did. I remember uh, Bill Cousins told me, he's, he's always one of the marshals, he says, Charlie says, uh, uh, you're going to be stopping traffic on the southbound side, and some other people are going to be stopping traffic on the northbound side. And I said, Bill, I was just run over by a scab car last year. Spent the whole year recovering. Uh, I don't need to be doing that anymore. I said, why in the hell did y'all pick me? He said, because you weren't at the meeting last night. <laughs> uh, but anyway, because I was holding up traffic, I was one of the last ones across the road and we had about 350 people there it took 200 people filled that building up it was wall-to-wall -wall people um, 150 of us stayed outside and we locked arms and sat down on the steps and impeded the police coming up to get into the building and just generally made nuisance of themselves there's a lot of fun that day uh, this uh, friend of mine who's working on building the injured workers organization who was there got in on the inside and she was very impressed with everybody's demeanor. She said, these guys are just so country and so polite and they said ma'am to all the secretaries and everything like this. Of course, Gingrich lied through his ass and talked about how his secretaries are manhandled and shouted abuses at and all this kind of stuff and just totally untrue. Somebody did write on the wall uh, boot mute or something like that, and that was the only defacement that, or destruction of pro public property that took place. Uh, 
but that that action actually produced a police riot. Uh, there was after the police finally got inside and negotiated with Stewart, uh, they agreed to leave, vacate the premises, go back to the buses, and leave. And everybody left. And we looked back in through through the glass doors and the big glass windows, and we noticed that Stewart was still inside talking to the police. And so Reverend James Orange, who's people's uh, action leader and mobilization leader and spiritual advisor and uh, this old veteran from the civil rights movement, who's just kind of a living legend. He's IUD, isn't he? Yeah, he's heavy IUD here. And uh, plus he's about six foot six and 260 pounds. But he looked back into the plate glass windows and asked the cops, what, what Stewart's still doing in there? How come he's not coming out? He'll be out in a couple of minutes, don't worry. Well, 15 or 20 minutes go by, a long period of time. It may have only been eight or 10 minutes, but it seemed like forever to me. And he was still being held in there or detained or or talk to. We didn't. We weren't sure what was going on. And the police were telling us to get moved towards the buses. And James Orange was saying, no, we're not leaving, Stuart. Uh, and they were saying, he's coming right out. And James was saying, you told us that 10 or 15 minutes ago. Uh, and finally, he said, we're going back inside and find out what's going on. We're not leaving. Him. Because he thought maybe he'd been arrested. Well, they tried to make the move back inside, and eight, some number of policemen, five to eight cops, uh, stood against the doors and tried to prevent this mob of 300 people from going inside. One of the sheriff's deputies, I think, I think he was a sheriff's deputy and not a cop county police, but he, he freaked out. He was on the outside of people, and he saw this crowd trying to pr push their way inside the building, and eight of his comrades uh, trying to hold the fort. And he jumped up on the railing that was around the, the brick porch and started walking across the heads and shoulders of people to get to his fellow officers. And one of these uh, sheet metal workers that he was stepping on just pulled away and the guy lost his balance and fell to the, to the, to the uh, balcony or the, the porch head first. But the crowd was so thick he couldn't drop like a rock. He just kind of was slithering his way down, getting more and more ticked off as he made his way down to the ground. He came up, he was totally out of control. And one of his partners had grabbed another guy around the throat and he started punching him in the face. And this guy was a really outraged being attacked. I mean, this crowd was largely white. They were largely building trades because that's who you get off in the middle of a weekday. Um, and a lot of them lived in Cobb County and they weren't used to being treated any way like this by police. They started punching back, which escalated the situation and uh, took a few minutes to bring under control. And there were some more negotiations and these guys weren't busted that had been doing the punching of the police and being punched by the police. But we all lived. We got across the road and this tall, skinny, very young black guy uh, was pretty near my myself and a couple of cops came running up to him, pushed their noses right up into his face and said, you get smart with me, weren't you? You get smart. They were trying to provoke him. Mm -hmm. And this guy kept backing up. I don't know what to talk about. I wasn't involved. I didn't have to do it. They busted him. And it happened so quick. And they hustled him back across the street. None of us had the presence of mind to surround the cops and demand that he be released. Uh, and then they busted James Orange after we were all safely back in the buses. Most of us... Another black guy. Yeah. This was outrageous. I mean, James was one of Martin Luther King's lieutenants. He is a, a big apostle of nonviolence. And, uh, he wasn't swinging his fist or anything like this. Because he's a pretty high-up union official in Atlanta. <laughs> and and highly respected, candy. highly regarded. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Anyway, just a week or two ago, the charges were dropped. We had a big campaign, and uh, some organized committee organized about 8,000 postcards into the uh, Cobb County District Attorney. Mm -hmm. Cobb County District Attorney is where we left off. And uh, there were some negotiations between Stewart and Reverend Orange, and they've been dropped. And that's pretty much the end of it. I mean, how about the other guy who was arrested? Is he okay? Yeah, he's okay. I mean, they were dropped against him also. What you know was he? You know, he was a fireman in oils. And what, what, why were they keeping Stewart Acuff in the building in the first place? There was just some some negotiations going on, some talking. Or, you know, we we don't uh, we really don't know the whole story. A lot of it seemed to be a lot of provocation. I mean, they obviously ran up to this young boy guy, Melvin Stewart, because he was the most street-looking guy there. <laughs> and I think the cops were very frustrated that some of them had been punched and uh, no arrests had been made. And they were determined to make arrests. And I think they thought the black guys could be prosecuted more successfully than some early white uh, carpenters from Cobb County. Probably right. That. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I just think that uh, the arrest were, and the whole incident, the violence that broke out and everything like that, I, you know, I think I'll lay all that at the feet of the police. Mm -hmm. Not at the feet of New Gingrich, though. Well, Cobb County is Newt Gingrich's base, and uh, that's where his big support is. Uh, I really felt that in order to oppose the contract on America, to oppose the right wing, wing agenda, that you had to actively organize against the Cobb County's tactics in, in, in trying to repress protest of Newt Gingrich's agenda. And that you had to oppose the the white supremacist uh, uh, decisions to arrest two black guys at this demonstration, and uh, that I felt that this would have promoted a real unity and a real a real educational opportunity for a lot of white members to see how the corporate class maintains the power it does. Uh, by uh, targeting people that they think are not are are not going to be defended, just by promoting white supremacist prejudices and biases. Did it work that way? Did people were was it an expose of that, or was it a reinforcement of that kind of racism? It wasn't nearly as much of an expose as I felt personally that it should have been. I felt that the Atlanta Labor Council should have really uh, focused on Cobb County at that point and on the arrests mm -hmm. and made a big deal of it uh, and talked about why they did arrest two black guys at a largely white demonstration when all the scuffling between the cops and the demonstrators were between white demonstrators and cops. Uh, and Stewart was really afraid that, uh, or really concerned that uh, it would divert people's attention from the main task, which was to focus on the contract and on Newt Gingrich and stuff like this. And my feeling was part of fighting Newt Gingrich is to expose his base. You know, for example, after the Oklahoma City bombing, Newt Gingrich came out and made a statement that the only thing that I heard or read where he condemned hate groups, but the only example of a hate group he gave was not, none of the white supremacist groups, none of the militia groups, none of them. He talked about Louis Farrakhan. <laughs> Louis Farrakhan's not uh, uh, one of my all-time heroes, uh, but he had nothing to do, there was no way to link him or anything like him uh, with Oklahoma City. And, and that just brought back to me the fact that Newt Gingrich is not going to attack his base. And he's not going to attack white supremacy. Um, one of the reasons, since we're on malicious 
one of the reasons that people of roughly our age group will oppose unions is that they'll say that the unions are reactionary. The union members are um, uh, all the stereotype, hard hat, beating up, hippie kind of people. Um, do you think there's any truth in that? Do you think Newt Gingrich represents a certain part of the labor movement? Um, no, Newt Gingrich represents none of the labor movement. I mean, what you were talking about really developed uh, during the Vietnam War, you know, with the hard hat uh, demonstrations of support for Vietnam War policy and beating up of, of anti-war protesters, you know, uh, building trades, construction. You know, there was a lot of tension in the 60s in the building trades, both around, uh, and, and union members generally, around um, Vietnam War policy, uh, around, you know, and the building trades especially were very conservative unions. Uh, a lot of them had uh, white only uh, clauses in their constitutions uh, that AFL Randolph had been trying for decades to get the AFL to take a stand against and uh, George Meany and his predecessor said that's an internal union affair and it's none of our business. And there was the whole Philadelphia movement to get blacks into the building trades and you know all this kind of thing. There was just this kind of tension that existed. Now since then, I mean, there are a lot of, there's a lot of the leadership that's very conservative. You know, I, I, I got sick at the, at, the, at the second Gingrich demonstration at the Galleria when this guy stood up and his speech at this anti -New, uh, New Gingrich demonstration was just what a great country this was. And, everything like this, and didn't talk about any of the problems of the country, which New Gingrich was the personification of. But uh, basically speaking, building tradesmen, uh, steel workers, auto workers, all feel under attack. They, they know that New Gingrich is no friend of theirs, even though the majority of white steel workers, for example, voted for Reagan both times voted for Bush, the majority of white steel workers. Uh, the majority of white trade unions voted Republican, uh, probably until the 1992 election when I think Clinton, I mean, you know, things really got so bad for the labor movement that most people uh, voted for, most white trade unions probably voted, the majority of white trade unions voted Republican. Uh, probably until the 1992 election, when I think Clinton, I mean, you know, things really got so bad for the labor movement that most people uh, voted for most white trade unions. Probably voted for Clinton. I haven't seen the figures on that, but I know prior to that, 68, uh, 88, 84, and 80, the majority of white trade unions voted Republican, but. If Newt Gingrich runs, for example, there's another vote for him. Now, there's a number of white trade unions that I know in my local who um, who do support a radical right-wing Republican agenda on a lot of questions, like affirmative action, uh, taxation, gun control. Uh, some speak very approvingly of the militias. Some will run around and talk about Waco. I ask him, well, if, if you're really upset about how the government and law enforcement people dealt with Waco, how do you feel about uh, when the police helicopters brought in the bomb and put it on top of this uh, black cult's house in Philadelphia and uh, blew away men, women, and children and burned down two and a half city blocks? And they never heard of it. Uh, it's you just a new thing. Yeah, the move thing. Uh, so there's a but for the cops to blow away the wife and kid of a white supremacist murderer uh, when he was being besieged uh, out west or or the Waco thing, people were all upset about it. But uh, you know that's that's a little off the subject.
Well, let me take, take you back back into a few months ago when you were talking, you mentioned in your discussion with cousins that you were kidding around about having gotten uh, hit by a car, by a scab. How did that come about? Okay, that was in June 1994. I was attending a uh, summer training institute at the Steelworkers the other year for a local union leadership uh, up in Blacksburg, Virginia, Virginia Tech, my old alma mater. I love to go up there. I just love Southwest Virginia. And uh, on an earlier time, we'd gone up there when uh, the Pittston strike was going on, and we caravaned down to the coal fields. It was wonderful. I went down to all my old haunts and hangouts, and uh, and we spent the day down there playing tag with coal trucks and state police and just having a great time, giving what support we could to the strike, and uh, st spending time at Camp Solidarity with the mine workers and everything. I just, I, was, I just loved it. I was so happy. And so in 94, we went up there and uh, the district director told us um, at the orientation session Sunday night that uh, on Wednesday, he was asking people to caravan and ride buses down to Kentucky to the coal fields, not to support mine workers this time, but some, uh, but the steel workers were, had organized a nursing home. And uh, nursing home re refused to bargain and that uh, had, that had provoked a strike and we were going down to rally and support the striking nursing home employees. And I went down with a couple of friends of mine, one from my local and an old buddy of mine uh, from Alcoa, Tennessee. And uh, we were walking in support of the picket line. It was not a shift change, but a one car had come in uh, and we would all haul scab out of it. You know, it's just a very normal picket line. We weren't trying to stop scabs. We weren't doing anything illegal. We weren't doing anything violent. We were hollering, hollering at them for being scabs, but we weren't even using foul language. Anyway, this one car came and pulled into the driveway and accelerated, and everybody jumped out of the way. I was right smack in the middle of the grill of the car and couldn't get out of the way. Got hit and thrown up on the hood of the car. And then the driver floored it, really accelerated. And I just, I, I thought to myself, this guy's trying to kill me. I didn't realize it was a woman driving. And uh, I was flat on my back on the hood of the car, and I was grabbing windshield wipers and flattening my hands out against the hood because she started, not only was she accelerating rapidly, but swerving very sharply left and right. Finally flung me out. And, uh, I hit my head on the asphalt and spent four days in the hospital. I uh, was unconscious for about 10 minutes. And got a concussion and some complications later on uh, uh, from the pinched nerve and possibly traumatic arthritis. But I've had some, some problems since then. Uh, and it was real funny when I mean, Joe Kiker, the district director, called me up to go out on this Firestone campaign. I said, well, Joe, he says, uh, he says, Charlie, you know, you might be doing some jail time in this campaign. And I said, I don't care about doing jail time, Joe. I said, but I'm not going to do any hospital time. I'm not going to stand in front of anybody driving anything bigger than a tricycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, no, you don't put it right Joe. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like famous last words. What was in this woman's mind? Why did she do this? Did she get arrested? Well, it's real funny. I've got a lawsuit against her. She's also filed a suit against me. She said that I've caused her great mental distress and, <laughs> and uh, physical and emotional damage and that I've made her unemployable. And she's trying to... Because she says that I sat down and heard her car. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> and, and terrorized her, and that people were being violent toward her and using abusive mm -hmm. uh, language. And uh, that I was the ringleader, and I'd been paid by the steelworkers specifically to go to the strike and deny her employment. Uh, and I'm trying to recoup 
my medical bills uh, yeah. and uh, and my lost time um, but um, she gonna win well I don't know it's real funny the town is very polarized it's a it's a town in the very extreme southeast corner of Kentucky Bell County it's the county just to the south of Harlan County and the mine workers have been busted out of that county pretty much it's only a couple of coal mines still organized. A lot of mines have been shut down. And it used to be a totally union county. And now it's about half and half. Uh, and steel workers have the hospitals organized. That's why they took on this nursing home. Nursing home. Some nursing home employees approached them and asked them for assistance in organizing. And uh, I don't know. It, it really depends on what kind of jury we get. Will the steel workers I don't think she'll win. I don't know that I can win either. Will the steel workers support you in this? Well, I certainly hope so. <laughs> um, if you look back in your life, what moments would you relive again, if you could? Well, give me a moment, actually. <laughs> well, the best work I really did in the steel workers uh, was in 87. And um, I think that's the time. There were two years I was real proud of my work, 92 and 87. In 87, uh, George Power had built Plant Vogel, a nuclear power plant, had grossly underestimated the cost. They initially thought it was going to cost $650 million and uh, for four towers and ended up costing for two towers $13 billion. And their proposal to the Public Service Commission was to increase power rates 10% a year for 10 years, double the power over 10 years' time. And that was going to put Atlantic Steel out of business. We are, are the biggest single consumer of electricity in the state of Georgia because we, we, we have uh, electric arc furnaces. Consumer known as my own. $20 million a year is worth back in the 80s. I don't know how much it is now. Uh, but that was going to put us out of business. And so I organized uh, my local and a number of other units to picket the PSC at the hearings. And uh, we had a lot of anti-nuke environmentalists join us. First time was strictly labor. The second time was everybody. We had about 50 people the first time. We had hundreds the second time. And uh, we really, uh, I think we really embarrassed Georgia Power. We certainly put a stop. We killed their proposal. Uh, what came out was much, much better for the consumer. Not the first time you've been on a picket line of Georgia Power. You and I were on a picket line of Georgia Power. In the 70s. Some, in the 70s. Do you remember when, that? When Georgia Power was buying South African coal. Oil. And uh, we went down there. It was a day as hot as any of the days we've had here. It's probably about 15 of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we picketed. We had signs that said, don't buy slave coal because that was mined in the apartheid regime with labor that had no right to organize, had no basic human rights at all. And, uh, and I remember we were in a van. We decided to go in to the uh, attend the stockholder meeting that was going on because somebody had a proxy vote. And the security people that were surrounding us during the whole picket had no idea we were going in. And after we got in and took off, they freaked out and ran us down and stopped us and frisked us and negotiated with us and finally allowed us to proceed on in there. It was a real memorable day. The other time I'm real proud of is um, we had a demonstration. I, we had a demonstration at Grady Hospital. Uh, the Georgia Dome. Which is where the Falcons play football now. 
was built non union. The building trades were just really getting desperate. They were about to get busted out of existence in Atlanta. They knew they had to get Olympics work done in union, and they had to get Grady, which was the biggest construction project at that time taken on. And uh, we were having a demonstration at Grady in support of the building trade union. And I got a flyer. I was I was hand built by somebody. Get, and it was the second flyer I'd seen on this subject, but it was talking about the the workers uh, the bill to gut the workers' comp law that was coming up before the 1992 session. And I had talked to Nan about this, Nan Ark, and uh, uh, the other flyer I'd gotten had been handed to somebody up in Cartersville. There was a lot of organizing work being done in northwest Georgia around the uh, carpet mills. Uh, and this was uh, just a ghastly bill that was going to greatly reduce the benefits and limit the benefits that injured workers could receive. And uh, this bill sailed through the Senate with only eight senators voting against it. It looked like it was a shoe in And then came this huge rally and demonstration at the Georgia legislature where these thousands of injured workers were bust in and it was paid for by their attorneys. There's a handful of really decent, committed, pro-worker, worker comp attorneys in Georgia, about 35. And uh, they saw what this bill would do to their clients. And they organized them, uh, brought box lunches for them and busted them in. Found out most of them came from Northwest Georgia, from the carpet mills, because the carpet mills are just, they're, they're totally unorganized. Uh, 40,000 workers at the mercy of the employers. Uh, the carpet mills chew them up and spit them out. Tens of thousands of permanently injured workers in Northwest Georgia from the carpet mills. No unionization, no health and safety standards. It's cheaper for the mills to injured workers and pay and try to browbeat them and taking some kind of a $10,000 settlement for the rest of their lives to remove all liability from them than it is to have strict safety and health standards. Mm -hmm. um, and I, my mind was blown at this demonstration. The labor movement endorsed about five days before it happened. Uh, somebody somehow convinced her neighbor this is something the labor movement ought to do. And uh, so there was a lot of labor people there, too. Uh, the activist unions that make up the core, the bulk of jobs of justice were there, and I got a few steel workers to go, and I was just amazed. And I noticed that at least half the people there were from the carpet mills, because I would see picket signs like, shoot me, I'm just a carpet mill slave. And uh, the picket signs had the names of the sponsors of the bill, and the guy who had introduced the bill was from the carpet mill area in Dalton, in Town Hill, Georgia. And my mind was racing during this rally. I just looking at this vast number of carpet mill workers, and I was thinking, you know, because of the experience of Nan being in the legislature, that uh, you know, a good campaign can get somebody kicked out of the legislature. And if these carpet mill workers are committed enough to get on buses and come to Atlanta, they might be committed enough to register to vote and, and give this guy a hell of a steer, really threaten his legislative career. And so I went up and uh, I started asking around. I asked John Sweet and some other workers' comp attorneys who the hell were responsible for this, who did this. And he, they gave me the names of the people in Northwest Georgia. And I went up with a proposal to them. I said, let's find somebody to run against uh, uh, Griffin, Jim Tyson Griffin, and uh, who had introduced the bill. And uh, we, we, we could find the people to vote against. They said, you know, carpet mill workers don't vote against. I said, well, by God, they might. Uh, and let's scare this guy. Let's 
practice some legislative terrorism. Let's send a message to legislators who have anti-worker bills that, by God, there are consequences to this action. Somebody can run against you and scare you. And I, I asked the union, I asked Joe Kiker, I said, will you give me five days a month to work on this campaign? And the lawyers up there recruited a young country lawyer to run. And we developed a campaign. I, I made great use of uh, Jim Coonan, who was the technocrat behind NAM's campaign and was a very successful young guy working on progressive people's political campaigns. And uh, he's, he's very, very smart in working on a campaign. And uh, anyway, uh, went up there, organized phone banks, organized uh, community meetings and all kinds of things, neighbor to neighbor stuff. We ended up beating this guy. And uh, it really was the proudest moment of my union career. <laughs> Although the union, I was doing most of this on my own time. The union to some degree supported me. And I made sure the people up, knew up there that it was the union that was responsible for this. And I went on from that with an ambition to organize a statewide organization injured workers. And this has been a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to do because I don't have a lot of time. But I've put out several proposals to unions to see if you can go into a, a, a totally non-union area like Dalton, which is nothing but a company town. Uh, I have friends who keep telling me they want to take me to this cafe that still has a blood stain from the last union organizer that were there during the 60s, we got shot. So friends. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, and, and I think they really believe that this place exists and this blood stain still is there and it's never cleaned up. But anyway, uh, that if you go in an area like that and you can build an organization that workers can learn for themselves the value of organizing, the value of campaigning, and how you can fight and how you can win, will stop this total pessimism, this defeatism, this total lack of confidence in their ability to, to take charge of their lives, and that it could really soften up the ground for a union organizing campaign. I mean, 40,000 unorganized workers, that's a prize. I mean, my ambitions is to see the carpet industry organized and the poultry industry organized in the South. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to have to wait until I retire before I can really put my energies completely into this injured worker campaign. There's one state where there's a successful injured workers union, that's Louisiana. They, they are very strong there. Mm -hmm. They're really able to defend workers' comp issues in the legislature. They're able to organize mutual support among, you know, when, when somebody gets injured permanently maimed on the job, they're like changing. They're no longer the breadwinner. They no longer have the life that they have every day, seeing the people they see every day. They become an isolated shut-in. Uh, it causes enormous family crises. And only somebody else who's been through this can really offer the kind of support that a person like this needs. So there's a couple of real compelling reasons to have an organization like this. Mm -hmm. uh, but one, of the most compelling from a union standpoint is they would make a tremendous ally of labor. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worthwhile for the unions to invest a few thousand dollars in it. Mm -hmm. And give somebody some time to do something like this. How would you You might. You might. Um, if you look back and said, this person was a mentor, or this person was memorable, who would you choose? Tell me about some memorable people you've encountered. Oh, God. I'm mostly thinking labor, but look at outside, of, too. Oh, there's, there's lots of people. Uh, there's Estes Rife, who was a steelworker organizer, an IED organizer. Uh, there's Nanny Washburn, who entered the textile mills when she was seven years old and devoted her whole life. She's 95 this year to the working class. Uh, I could have I 
sat down, if I'd had time to think about this question, it's a great question. I sat down and written a long list of people. Well, tell me about the first poet. Eustace Wright? Estes Wright. Estes Wright. Uh, What's he, why memorable? Because he was such a strong and capable guy. No nonsense. Uh, when everybody in Steelworkers was freaked out about the gang of radicals at Atlantic Steel, he he didn't get hysterical. He wanted to meet them. Uh, and he was paid by the union. You know, it was just extraordinary to me that this guy was so open-minded. But his commitment was to organizing workers, not Cold War ideological principles, something like that. And he would work with anybody. Uh, another guy that I really admired uh, a great deal uh, came out of a local and took over the IUD organizing department. It was Harold, um, excuse me, I just had a, a mental bar. I have to come back to him. Okay. But uh, he was the same way. You know, during the 80s, when there was a lot of hysteria around. The jobs of justice getting going because of all the radicals that have attracted. Uh, he stood up and said, I don't give a damn who these people are. They want to work. They want to organize. Uh, and that's what I want. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. And Manny Washburn. Yeah. You know, she was an old radical. She was taught how to read by an organizer from the Communist Party. And uh, she, when, when all the Reds were run out of Georgia, in the late 40s, she and her family, well, being from Georgia, they didn't have anywhere to go. And they were around. They got involved in whatever was going on. But they thought was good. They they went to Selma during the Selma movement. Uh, At the nineteen sixties. Uh, in the nineteen sixties. Mm -hmm. And uh, she got involved in the anti war movement. She, you know, whatever was happening, mm -hmm. that was a fight. Challenge the power. She would get in it. I first met her on the picket line at Mead Corporation during the Mead Wildcats fight in seventy two. Anybody you wish you could take a poke at? If you had a chance. Oh, hey. I got homicidal fantasies all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that list is too long. Too oh, long okay. to go at. Uh, you know, the people. Why don't we tell me about dead people? You like wish you had gotten a shot at. We don't want to talk about any live people. <laughs> I mean, you know, I got a huge problem against people. I can tell you a guy who's living today. Uh, who's a high up labor official in Tennessee. Uh, I encountered him at an AFL CI leadership school in Durham, North Carolina, and in '89. And uh, he was, uh, I'd heard about this guy previously, because some, some workers at a GE warehouse that had been closed down had started a, uh, something called the Tennessee, Tennesseans for Industrial Renewal or something. TUR was its an acronym. But anyway, the, you know, they would often try to ally with the labor movement. He was convinced that, you know, these folks from Marstown, Tennessee were just a bunch of reds or something. This guy's a, totally a, a cold warrior, cold war fighter who Who's main? He, he's a he's a clone of of, uh, of Lane Kirkman, and, and, he, and he idolizes Lane Kirkman. One way, this guy and I found ourselves at the same breakfast table at this leadership conference in the Berlin. and somehow this subject got around to the '88 uh, election campaign, and he said that Jesse Jackson had destroyed the Democratic Party. And I said, Jesse Jackson was the best thing that ever happened with Democrats. 
said he's the only Democratic nominee who will walk a pig line, who is totally uncompromised when he takes the labor's positions. And he looked at me and he knew I was a red. He could just, I could just see it in his face. And later on, that uh, during the session, uh, there was a presentation by the Virginia AFL-CIO, uh, which is dominated very much by the sea worker local in Newport News, uh, the Newport News dry dock and shipbuilding plant, which has 17,000 people. And the steel workers organized that in the late 70s and had a huge fight to get that in. Anyway, the president of that local, who was a Jackson supporter and a white guy, uh, gave a presentation on the governor's race that elected the first black governor in the history of the country, Doug Wilder, in Virginia. And he made a very, very unusual uh, presentation, but he, he went down and he said, <clears throat> all the urban counties voted for Wilder. All the rural counties voted for the Republican Coleman. And he said, with the exception of five rural counties, and he had a big map of Virginia up there, and he, he pointed to these counties. And I said, uh, those, those counties are in the coal fields, aren't they? He said, that's right. I said, would you... Uh, suggest possibly that the reason that the miners voted for a black man for governor, that the white miners voted for, largely white miners voted for a black for governor of Virginia was because during the Pittston strike, uh, when Jesse Jackson came down, they got their first sense of a black political activist who was standing up for labor and thought, well, maybe, maybe that's what all black politicians do. And he said that's exactly why Doug Wilder is the governor of Virginia, because those five counties made a difference. I said, so you would say that Jackson is a good force in the Democratic Party, wouldn't you? He said, my God, he's what we need. <laughs> and I turned around and I looked at this jackass from Tennessee, <laughs> who's still alive, who still runs the labor movement in Tennessee. You tell me his name in 10 years from now, you can see that. He'll live longer than my life. Uh, and I just smiled at him. And he glared at me. He had made an enemy for life. And he and I are both equally ideological. Mm -hmm. And we are probably both equally adept at holding a grudge. I know he's going to hate me as long as I hate him. But he's the problem with the labor movement. Nothing gets done in Tennessee unless it goes through him. It's his, he, he's like a feudal lord. And if it has to do with labor, it's got to go through him. And as far as I'm concerned, he's the reason that we're hurting so bad. This is tape two with Charlie Orock, uh, July 24th, 1995. Charlie, when you were working at Atlantic Steel, some women tried to get into the steel plant and uh, take on jobs as steel workers. Do you remember that campaign? Oh, I remember it very well. Tell me about it. Uh, well, the local chapter of the Coalition of Labor Union Women had decided to take as one of their projects getting jobs for women in non-traditional places that were relatively high paying so that women would have options other than really low paying jobs like laundries and <laughs> no, <come on. laughs> things like that. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I often think of laundries when I think of Atlantic Steel because Atlantic Steel can be a really hot place to work. But a laundry is a very hot place to work and you just get minimum wage in a laundry. And it's mostly, it's all women that work in a laundry. Anyway, uh, a woman got hired. There was a big, the, the clue had picket lines, coalition labor union women, had picket lines. Uh, we had, there was a big campaign. Some of us in the plant gave support to this campaign. 
and a woman was hired, and then later on more women were hired. And I remember the uh, first woman, woman that was there, Louise Runyon, uh, had been told by a young guy that worked at the steel plant that um, he was in a trade and craft uh, training. And during that training, uh, the safety guy had come in to give an orientation talk. And one of the things he said was, well, women, the only reason women are coming out here to work was that they were prostitutes and they were just trying to get uh, a big client list. And that's the reason they come out to work. And so Louise thought this was an outrageous statement for the safety guy to make. And if this did not uh, enhance the safety of the women working out there, it made them much more vulnerable. Uh, and it was just a terrible statement. And uh, she came to a union meeting and complained. And we had a big debate in the union meeting about whether or not the union should, in fact, uh, denounce this statement. And I remember uh, my dearly departed international rep who, uh, who made the statement, Charlie Parker, that, uh, uh, well, Louise, if you don't want to have this kind of stuff being said, why'd you come out here in the first place? Um, but... What did Louise say to that? Well, I don't even remember Louise's response. But it was, she was mad, though. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and there was a big meeting at, uh, at a, there was a big clue meeting in which leaders of the local came to defend their opposition to women working in steel plant. And uh, it, the women who were not involved in this campaign could not believe their ears. They didn't think that there would be such ignorance and bigotry on the part of trade union leaders. Mm -hmm. um, and they urged the women in this campaign to file suit against the union and the company. Well, they had never been the intention of the women in this campaign to file suit against the union. They wanted to educate the unions to the necessity of promoting equality and equal opportunity and this kind of thing. They didn't want to sue them for complicity with the company and denying women opportunities. Uh, but. Uh, I mean, Ira Richards is still alive, but long retired. He was still at that time the vice president. I mean, he made a comment as to uh, talking about uh, split tails and this kind of thing. It's a split tail. Uh, split tail is a very vulgar um, way to refer to a certain part of the women's anatomy. Uh, in which men are referred to as hardtails and women are referred to as foottails. Ooh, slap that boy's face. Yeah, anyway. Uh, it was a very shocking thing for a lot of the women in that room to hear, who up to that point had no idea the barriers and the obstacles that were being faced by the women involved in this campaign. And what finally happened to them? Uh, there were a lot more women hired on uh, during the 70s, and then, uh, gosh, I guess there's six or seven left, maybe six. They get laid off or quit? A lot of them quit. I mean, during the 70s, uh, there was a high turnover among both men and women. So some women quit, and... Uh, and then the company stopped hiring anybody. Charlie, you were going to tell me about some more uh, memorable people you've encountered in the labor movement. 
Um, well, just some real memorable people at work. Uh, were some of the black guys that broke color lines. We had we had integrate we had segregated lines of promotion up through the end of the sixties. And uh, the union didn't oppose them. Uh, it was a it was consent decrees that brought about an end to them. That the union played no role in whatsoever between the civil rights movement and the government and the plan. Uh, and it was real difficult. Uh, it took a tremendous strength of character to put up with the kinds of stuff that uh, faced a lot of the black guys that went into previously all white departments or all white lines of promotion. I remember this one guy who lived in New York City, I can't remember his name, big strong guy, tremendous dignity and pride. Uh, nobody really challenged him. Nobody gave him any help in learning the job, but nobody messed with him. I just always admired him a whole lot. Um, there's a steel worker in Birmingham, Alabama, I mean, uh, Gail Dunaway whose who's absolute optimistic spirit about being a woman leader in steel workers and a very, very male-dominated union just really inspires the heck out of me. Her spirit, her gumption, her fortitude just really inspire me a lot. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, <laughs> The little laps I had before, I don't know why it happened to me, but uh, it happened when I was trying to think of Harold McIver's name. <laughs> but his daddy was the first president of the local uh, at Atlantic Steel in 1942. Yeah. And Harold led the J.P. Stevens campaign in North Carolina in the 70s. Um, if you had a chance to stand up on a podium and talk to all the young people in the labor unions. What advice would you give them? Notice I'm not including you among the young people anymore. <laughs> I, think, I think what's happening in this country and in the world today is as big, as significant a change as the Industrial Revolution was. Uh, you can look at in Alabama, where they're trying to put in, where LTD and a Japanese consortium are trying to put in a steel mill that's going to employ 330 workers and produce 2.2 million tons of steel a year. And you look um, 80 miles away at Gaston, Alabama, where Gulf State Steel is that produces 1.1 million tons a year with 1,800 workers. And you see what's happening. Uh, techno technology, computerization, automation, robotization is really shrinking the industrial workforce. Also the globalization and export of jobs overseas. Uh, and you know, the steel workers are having mounting a big campaign to stop the construction of that company. It's a trico in Alabama. And I don't know, you know, they can make it a whole lot more expensive for them, they can, they can make it a whole lot more difficult for them, and they should be doing everything they can, but I think that's basically a defensive battle. At some point, the labor movement is going to have to go on the offense. They're going to have to seriously challenge relations of power in this country and in the world. That's going to be difficult. Uh, most communist regimes have fallen. Uh, capitalism looks ideologically uh, unbeatable. Uh, the power of international corporations and multinationals 
international capitalism, his immense uh, the ascendancy of the right wing in this country points to their political success. Um, but I think the labor movement has got a lot of blame to share in that. I, I think the labor movement became a national labor movement at the end of World War II. And I think a, I think a deal was struck between the labor movement to um, assist in the United States becoming the unchallenged superpower in the world. Uh, and certainly the, the, uh, the leader of the anti-communist world. And the payoff for the labor movement as part of this deal was that they would benefit from an unchallenged U.S. economic dominance. The problem is, is that we're not unchallenged anymore. We've got big competitors in Europe and in Asia. And uh, with the globalization of the economy and the fall from predominance of the U.S. economy, this and the technological revolution that's going on, this really means very different things to the labor movement. And I think our leadership is very slow to realize this. Uh, although there is a big, there was a revolution when Lane Kirkland was forced to resign. There's just no doubt about that. Uh, it really says something about the dissatisfaction in the ranks of labor with the tremendous uh, decline in the numbers and the power of the labor movement. But we can't, we can't find a defense of that. We. And we can't let the Democratic Party take us for granted all the time. You can't have Democrats who are trying to move to the right to challenge Republicans that way. There's this huge number of people that don't vote anymore in this country because they don't see any reason to vote. Uh, there is no challenge to the trends that are going on in this country. The labor movement's got to be part of that challenge. Uh, and one of the ways they could do that, I feel, is to stop letting Democrats take them for granted. Uh, which they do because the, the Democrats know that, that the labor movement is not going to support Republicans. Uh, we have got to organize the unorganized. Um, a vast number of people in really dead end, no future jobs. And um, those tasks are not easy. Um, I took a few of your things. And um, that's going to be part of the task of the new leadership of the AFL-CIO, but I don't think a broad enough debate is going on now in this, in this uh, debate about the future direction of the AFL-CIO. For example, nobody's talking about what should we do about the Democratic Party, whether we should embrace a Labor Party or a People's Party. We should join with Jackson's efforts to go independent or whatever. There's just no talk about that. We, we can still be taken for granted because we're taking for granted we're going to vote support the Democrats. Uh, that's one thing that's not being debated. The other thing that's being debated is what to do about this tremendous change. We can't just keep fighting defensive battles. Why oppose technological change? You know, why don't we really seriously go after a 25 or 30 hour work week? Why don't we deal with this by lessening the time that people spend at work? Uh, instead, those of us who are lucky enough to have jobs spend much more time at work, much less time with our families. Um, there's so much that needs to be done that's going to be very difficult for the labor movement to be.
why don't we really seriously go after a 25 or 30 hour work week? Why don't we deal with this by lessening the time that people spend at work? Uh, instead, those of us who are lucky enough to have jobs spend much more time at work, much less time with our families. Um, there's so much that needs to be done that's going to be very difficult for the labor movement to be done because the labor movement was in opposition to radicalism in this country in the name of anti-communism, but it wasn't just Stalinism, it wasn't just the Soviet Union, this wasn't the Communist Party that was being opposed, uh, it was anti-capitalism that was being opposed. Uh, and that may sound like some fine points, but it's very difficult for us to look at radical solutions when we as a movement have spent so much time crushing radicalism in our own ranks. Let me force you to get a little more particular. But I'm Joe, but pretend I'm just Joe Blow or Joan Blow standing in a local union hall. And I say, well, but what exactly do you want me to do now? I want the labor movement to look seriously at breaking with the Democratic Party. I want the labor movement seriously to develop strategies to deal with the automation and the technological revolution that's going on by calling for a shorter work week. I want the labor movement to seriously understand the history of this country as it relates to, to racial issues, to racial oppression, and to begin an educational program of its membership, predominantly white membership, around issues of affirmative action. I want us to seriously challenge the right-wing radical movements like the militias, like the NRA, uh, and make a bid for the hearts and minds of our white membership and white working people generally in this country. Charlie, you've been um, an organizer. You're an organizer now. Steel worker. Uh, mine worker. Mine worker organizer. Um, when are you going to retire? And what are you going to do when you retire? What's in your future now? Well, um, it's funny that you ask about retirement. I never thought about retirement until this past January when I was having uh, a lot of arthritic pain in my shoulder and arm and one week in January I was scheduled to work 102 hours and uh, I was just thinking a little bit about this country and the situation we were in and when I would ever find time to do any of the organizing projects like the injured workers organization or any of the other stuff I do in my own time when I have to work 102 hours at the plant and uh, I decided to get the pension book and see when I could make my earliest uh, retirement and take the health care plan with me. And I found it was two and a half years. And so I might retire in two and a half years. I don't know. Uh, of course, I couldn't live on the ridiculously low pension they pay. I'd have to have another job. Nobody at Atlantic Steel retires until they're 62 or 65 when they can draw Social Security. That's what they're largely dependent upon. Uh, so I'd have to get another job, and I might work for a year. More. I might get a teaching certificate. Um, I don't know what I'll do. I'll have to work. Um, but I would also like to write. Um, I love historical fiction. I like to try my hand at it sometimes. I also like to write some, put my ideas on paper, and I do that sometimes. Uh, but you can't make a living as a writer, I know that. And uh, so I would have, I would, in answer to your question, I would get some kind of a job where I'd have weekends off, wouldn't work a four-term rotating schedule where you have one weekend out of a month off, and you work every seven days, midnights, evenings, or day shift. Uh, I'm getting through all this stuff. And 
Of course, I never know. I might stay in plant for six more years and get out after 30, who knows. But my plans at this time are to get out in about two and a half years hmm. and work at some other job that hopefully would give me, that would not be as well paid, but would give me a little more time to work on the injured worker organizing or helping to pull together a network of workers in the poultry industry or the carpet mill industry or one of the great southern unorganized industries uh, in some kind of a part, hopefully, of a AFL-CIO campaign to organize the South. Otherwise, on an unofficial campaign to organize the South. Looking back, just to, just to wrap up, looking back, would you say it's been a good one? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, Got a leading hey, question there. Has it been a bad life? <laughs> it's, uh, I've had my issues as much as anybody else around dissatisfactions and lack of self-confidence and stuff. I mean, I've often felt that I'm not primarily a particularly good leader of people. I've never really influenced large numbers of people. I think I do good work in house calls. I think I do fairly good organizing work in certain situations. Uh, but I've certainly never been uh, a working class hero or John. Somebody could say, if the Beatle or the Stone. It's John Lennon. Uh, but. Uh, and I know that I never will be, although it certainly has been a fantasy of mine in the past. Uh, and I've, I have spent a lot of my time at the plant and isolated from certain segments of the workforce. And uh, in some ways they were kind of hurtful. I've had... Uh, personal issues that have been painful to me. Um, but overall, the fact that I really enjoy learning new things, I really enjoy people, uh, have been a couple of blessings on me that have really enabled me to enjoy my life.